Bob, I'd like to welcome you to our church. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate the privilege to, to be with you today. Um, I wonder if we can begin with a word of prayer, but I want to ask you to do something with me uh, in this prayer. I'm going to ask that you close your eyes. Not everyone does for prayer, but please close your eyes this morning. And don't open your eyes until I ask you to. Okay? There's a reason for that. You'll come to understand it. Will you join me in prayer? Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the blessing to be able to come into your house, to be able to have the peace that you give, to feel the awe of you with us. We need that. We pray so much. I pray so hard for these people this morning that they might feel your Holy Spirit, that you might be with us in everything that is said this morning, not my words, but your words. This precious day that we think so much about our Savior, that you would take extra special care of us this morning, drawing us close to you. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the forgiveness of our sins and lay them before your throne this morning. We pray that you'll be with us in all that we say, in all that we do through this coming week, and help us to enjoy our time and experience with you, O oh Lord. We thank you for the things that you give to us. Help us this day to experience you in ways we have not before. Thank you, Father God, for this time with you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can open your eyes now. I wonder what you thought about the, the prayer that we had. If it didn't pick up too well. Um, did you catch the sounds that I played for you? This doesn't want to shut off. <laughs> the prayer that we had, you know, I like your church because it's so quiet. I'm a person that I was blessed when I came to your church this morning that I could come in and spend time with God in prayer. Not because I'm speaking. I need it every single week. Church for me is to come to a place that is really a temple of God to take all the mistakes I've made during the week and lay them before his throne and ask for forgiveness. To feel his presence in my day and my life and to be refilled, to get my cup refilled. A lot of people talk about being Christian, but they don't know what it's like until you're living that fulfilling experience. If you, if you were to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 2, I think it begins right there in the first, the first, the second chapter at the very beginning of the second chapter, and I think by memory it's the second story of John chapter 2. First there's the wedding, and then starting in verse 12, Jesus is at the temple. It isn't the Passover time, it's before the Passover time. And Jesus comes into the temple, and what I wanted you to experience in prayer is you to compare if the noises came through good. Of the first part of an experience where hopefully you could feel the Holy Spirit and you could sense a peace and, and we're in a time with God, and then you have these noises that distract and pull the mind. And that's what Jesus saw when he went to the temple that day. All the noises of the sheep noise multiply that by hundreds. The cows, 
the pigeons and the fluttering and the people around. Couldn't get for you any type of recording of people arguing about money. Was what they were doing any different in the dark ages when they were selling, pay so much and your sins are forgiven? You had to take your money, you had to buy a special money from the temple for the exchange to be able to take that money at the temple to be able to buy the pigeons, the doves, the cows, the lambs for your offerings. And all of that was what? It was a way that man took something that God was giving us that was supposed to be so pure and so good and teach us about Christ. And instead, we as humans turned it into a way to make money. We turned it into a cultural thing. And then we declared it acceptable. I say we because we do the same thing today. Sometimes in our churches, in between the Sabbath school and the church is our market time where we can sell books and we can do all kinds of things and, and it's okay. And how much did that break from the Bible study that we had or more important, break the process of going into the sanctuary? And what is the sanctuary to us? How much of what we do today, especially today, in our culture in the United States today, in all that's going on out there in that culture, how much have we taken it and declared, oh, tradition, custom, this and that, and how does it impact our worship of God? How pure is the worship? I have a passion for children in Adventist education. I was in a family of 12 kids. I chose to leave home. I packed my bags, talked to my, my box that I had. I had talked to the pastor. He came and picked me up, and I put myself through Adventist Academy. I learned about Christ at that academy. That academy saved my soul. I went back years later and baptized my brothers and sisters back into the Seventh-day Adventist Church because they didn't have the foundation, the understanding. I remember when my 50-year-old brother said, Bob, will you tell me the story of Moses' baby and in, in, in how his, his uh, sister put him in something and put, her, put him in some kind of a river? And I said, that's a crater roll story. You don't remember that? And he said, you don't use it, you lose it. How easy it is for our temple, our minds, Sabbath or not Sabbath, to be filled with the noises of society and to lose our way. There's a couple of other stories that are important that I'm thinking that you're all aware of. Matthew 25, the story of the ten virgins. Remember that story? How many of you know what I'm talking about or will read it? Okay. So there's five that have a full lamp and five that have half full. They go to sleep. They all fall asleep. What do we believe about death? Basically, they all died. Hmm. You know, an interesting statistic by the federal government that I helped too depends on whether you, which part of the government, Justice Department, or Highway Administration stuff that you talk to, but between 100 and 162 people got in their car this morning and are not coming home tonight. And one of them that happened on the way here this morning on the turnpike. I passed the accident, the really bad accident when I came here. 100 to 162 people got in their car and won't come home every single day. So when I go see someone who feels so bad and why has God allowed me to get cancer? I say, you should be praising the Lord. You're not one of those 100 to 162 people. You got two, three months, they've told you, to put your life in order, to say goodbye to your family, to work out your salvation with God, to ask forgiveness for your sins, to put your whole life together. He's given you two to three months, and those people didn't get anything. They didn't know. They didn't get any notice. They didn't get the time to ask for forgiveness for things or to say goodbye to their families. And you got that. You get that. It's a big difference. They fall asleep, and then the, the Scripture says something happens, second coming, midnight cry, and they wake up. And the ones whose heart is full of the Holy Spirit, 
oil. They go in with the groom. The others, they can't go in. You know, in my life and in my scripture reading and work, those are the ones of us who have said, going to church is enough. I pay my tithes. I, I do what I need to do, and the Lord's going to take care of me on the other. He's going to forgive me. And during the week, I don't really involve myself with church. I'm not really involved with prayer life or scripture at home. It's just I'm not, the bottom line is, fully committed to this. I'm a little bit, you know what they talk about on all the news channels sometimes. This is fantasy. This is just fantasy. And if this is fantasy, then God's not real. And if God's not real, I don't have to worry that much. Look at the scripture reading. There's actually three that I picked out for today. Philippians 2, 12, 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. That's not just think about it, talk about it, move through the day. That's, you need to be seriously concerned about that. For it is God who works in you both to will, to want to do it, to want to have a relationship with him. God does that for you. And to work for his good pleasure. And to make things work out. Second text, Hebrews 12, 2 and 3. For those of you that take notes, if you want, raise your hand and I'll repeat these. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. My relationship with Jesus on a regular basis means that it builds my faith on a daily basis. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He could have stayed in heaven. He didn't need to come down here and die, but he did. Despising the shame and seated at the right hand of, God, of, of the throne of God, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. The third one, 1 Peter 2.21 for to this you have been called. Oh my, there goes that thing with filling your heart. You have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so you might follow in his footsteps. See, the, the bottom line with, with the ten virgins that makes it really hard for you is Psalm 139. If you don't, Remember any other text today, remember Psalm 139 and go home and read it this afternoon because you're in big trouble because of Psalm 139. Psalm 139 says that you were knitted together in your mother's womb, so it doesn't make any difference how old you are today. You were knitted together in your mother's womb, and he knew every thought you've had to this point and every thought you're going to have. He's placed opportunities out and he knows the choices that you're going to make. And he has planned to add more choices based upon the choices that you've already made because he wants you to have a relationship with him. So he keep, he's planned already when you were born to put that out there. In addition to all that, he's given you talents and gifts, some that you haven't even realized that you have yet. Mark Twain says, the two greatest days in a person's life is the day you were born and the day you understand why. For me, what I've learned in traveling and working all over in the church and doing things outside of the church too, the two greatest days to me is a per the day the person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because of John and Romans, is when we accept Jesus Christ, we step on that path to walk to heaven. The second day is when you find yourself in fulfillment. When you have found the gifts that he has given you and you're doing what he wants you to do. There was a big dispute between my mom and dad before I was born. Two weeks before my mother passed away, she asked to see me. And so I dropped everything and went to see her. I had um, 
prayed for her when she had cancer seven years and seven months earlier. And the Lord chose to heal her in a real miracle. The doctors had said on Wednesday that she had the cancer and it was really bad. We did the anointing service on Thursday. I had had her Adventist doctors set her up for appointments to retest her on Friday. Took all day and they did that and the cancer was completely gone. But she made a promise to the Lord in that prayer service that we had with her, in that anointing service. She made promises to God. And seven years later, she broke those promises. And about two days after she broke them, she sent me a note because the cancer was back. Two weeks before she passed away, she asked to see me. She told me why she never told me that she loved me. Dad, my dad had done something really, really bad. She didn't want me. She tried to abort me seven times. And the night, that, uh, the night before I was born was the last of the seven times. She'd put all the children to bed. Uh, she was in depression. Um, he wasn't a very good person at all. She poured gasoline all over the house. But before she could get a match to light it, she heard this horrid noise, she said, outside. And she looked out, and the neighbor man was coming. And he came up to the door, and the house was surrounded by moose. This was in southern Michigan, Saline, Michigan. And um, she asked about that. I mean, he asked about the moose. He'd seen them come in a large patched group past his house, and so he came over with them. And then he smelled the gasoline. Her water broke. He took her and the kids to the hospital. Separate from that, I had an aunt. Now that's Celine, Michigan, over here. I had an aunt who had lived in Boston. Her husband was an alcoholic. She was pregnant. He beat her up and she lost the baby boy that was inside of her. She went home to Messina, New York, and that had happened a year or so before. And she had prayed to the Lord to have another child, a boy, but they were, her and her husband were now in divorce or divorced. And she had a dream, and an angel said, now my dad did not tell anyone where he put my mother. But the angel told my Aunt Jean, your boy is in Saline, Michigan. Say nothing to no one, but get up and go to Saline, Michigan. So she didn't say anything to anyone. She got up and she went to Saline, Michigan. I was born at 7.06 and Aunt Jean walked in the hospital at 7.15. It was worked out that I would be given to my Aunt Jean instead of Child Protective Services. And the other children, they worked out something. In the first year of my life, I lived with my Aunt Jean. At that time with my mother, she explained why numerous times in my life I was shipped off to Aunt Jean for a year or so at a time. You can understand a little bit why I chose to go to Academy. I chose to go to Union Springs Academy. And out of there, I left New York and I went to Southern. At Southern, um, I couldn't get a job and I didn't have the money to get into Southern, Southern Adventist University. I prayed and prayed and prayed. I only had a couple thousand dollars that I'd saved. Right or wrong, I went to a Kentucky Fried Chicken and they were looking for an assistant manager and I'm, I'm not experienced, I'm 18 years old, so I went to the manager and I said, I'll give you $500 if you hire me. <laughs> for two months, for two months, and if I don't make this the best store in Chattanooga, you can let me go and keep the $500. But I can't close on Friday night, and I can't open on sat Saturday morning because it's my Sabbath. I won't work during Sabbath. So I'll come in and close Saturday night because it's October and the sun, when the sun goes down down there. And otherwise, I'll open and close and run the store for you through the whole week. They were typically at the end of the day having a tray of two or two of chicken parts left over. I watched the sales for just a week or so and prayed really hard. Within 10 days, the employees noticed when we ended the day, we'd only have one chick piece of chicken or no chicken left over. I cut my waist. 
I watched the people that came in, and I looked at all the churches around that area of Rossville, Georgia, and I went and saw the pastors and told them I would give them a free nine-piece of chicken if they would bring their congregations in. In less than a month, we were the number one store in Chattanooga, and the top bosses came and asked him how he was doing it. But when it came before, around Christmas, a lady wasn't looking. She ran a traffic light, hit me doing 60 miles an hour. They said my head took out. I didn't have the seatbelt on, both windows on both sides of the car. But I walked away from the accident, but I didn't have a car. So I paid employees to go the 20 miles to Chattanooga and back to come pick me up and take me back home until the insurance could be worked out and I could get another car. But on Friday, the manager insisted that he be the one to come and pick me up. And so he's the boss, so I agreed. I reviewed with him our agreement about Sabbath. But it, I had to be out of the store an hour before sundown. But it, it came to that, and he wouldn't go. He wouldn't go. And finally, I said, listen, I have to leave the store. And he said, well, just remember three things. It's 20 miles to Chattanooga, I mean to Collegedale. Seventh-day Adventists don't believe in breaking the law. And it's against the law in Tennessee to hitchhike. So in December, in between Christmas, I think it was the 29th, I walked the 20 miles home to Collegedale. It's emotional because God was with me the whole way. It set principles in my life to live. He talked to me about the highway is really our walkway. How many people weren't abiding by any laws? How many people were concerned about being in front of the cars and not where they're going, but how many people they could get behind them by the time they got there? I saw a lady that pulled off and just stopped and wept and how in life tragedies happen and we, we pull off the highway. And sometimes we don't ever get back on and it's our choice. There was a van that stopped with people in it, and when I walked past them, they looked like zombies, either drugs or tired or something. There was a section of road I had to go to with no lights, extremely poor, high crime. I had no phone, nothing to do but walk through it. But the Lord was with me the whole way. The promises in the Bible kept coming back. I didn't make it to church the next day, but my wife did. And she told a story in Sabbath school, and little Debbie's father happened to be in Sabbath school. I got a, she got a call at our trailer the next day and were asked to apply at little Debbie's even though they weren't hiring. And we both went to work at little Debbie's. After I was there for a week or so, they had me working as a boxer, boxing up cookies and four guys on the other machine, and every 20 minutes, because they were behind, I had to go over there, and they came over where I was ahead. And there was a man watching behind me, and he came up and had me pulled off the machines, and he said, how is it that the, you're ahead and these four guys keep getting behind? And I didn't know who he was, and I said, because they're talking to each other, number one. And then there's a way to do this that's very simple. So he said, will you, will, will you show me what it is? And I showed him if you set the boxes here and you set the tape machine there and there's the sound of the machine, I said, all you have to do is flow with the machine and you just move with the sound of the machine. So when I pick up the box, I come back and push it and open it and then move the hand back over and it slides these two slides and you pick up the tape and this hand pulls it down and you tape over the top and then flip it over and you bend over the top of it and the machine kicks out the 16 boxes and you flip it over that and you put your hand underneath and flip the box over like this and it's just like doing chai, tai chi and, and then you bring the box back and you pick up another box and I said you never get tired as long as you're moving because that's nature. It's a principle of just moving with nature. It turned out that was Mr. McKee. He asked me, can you turn this into a machine? Can you make a machine do that? And so he had me in engineering and working directly for him ever since that day. 
Ellsworth McKee has been the father I never had. The church has never paid a day a salary for me or for anything that I do. That company gives to Oklahoma tithe far more than needed to pay for my salary wherever I work, which is in your conference. Plus, they and other major corporations that I help, they give money for schools, churches, all different types of programs. I have learned through my life to stay close to God, to depend upon him. I don't worry about the church leaders and what they're doing. The church is his bride. I don't try to micromanage what the bride, the church is doing, a conference or a union. If a president calls and asks me to help with a union, I don't get involved with the politics that they might have. God has called me and given me a gift in business. I wanted it to be building. I went, took a year's worth of building technology at Southern, got all A's. During that year, we built three houses. There was a boy that I was in school with named Schmitty. His dad owned the construction company. Schmitty used to keep his, um, his skill saw clipped to his waist. When we were cutting wood for the, for the roof, the plywood for the roof, Smitty had a pencil behind his ear, and I noticed he never pulled it out. He just looked, cut the wood, and it fit. The teacher told me I couldn't cut wood anymore because I'd always cut it, mess it up, and I'm just cutting it like this. Schmitty actually cut it like this and, what, beveled it so that it fit together, and he never used a measuring tape. Wasn't my gift. I was so frustrated but because I had taken my whole paycheck in 1973 from McKee Foods Corporation, $400, which was a lot at that time, to build a set of steps, not a porch, just three steps to go into a mobile home. And I ended up with a pile of wood. I was so discouraged like that story of Nehemiah kind of thing. And I went into work and Mr. McKee said, you're not yourself today. What's wrong? And I told him and he said, boy, your gift is not in your hands. It's in your head. And it took me years to understand that, that God had given me a gift when he knitted me together. He knew what was going to happen with my mom and dad. He knew what I was going through. And I, like you, am supposed to use all those experiences to be able to be a better person and do more for him. Fast forward to 1999, and I was working for Elder McClure, who I had a tremendous amount of respect for. And the more I worked with him, he was a man filled with such prayer I had two or three other mentors that I was working with. Elder Wilson was, had been guiding me because working in education and stuff, I wasn't trained as a pastor, and they pulled me into pastoral-type work in helping pastors. And I remember a day where I fell before the Lord in, in, in Chattanooga area, and I, I just wept and cried before the Lord. I like the music from the Eagles, but I came to accept that the Eagles aren't going to have a concert in heaven. I liked Elton John's music, but I realized he's not going to have concerts there too. The words don't really go with praising God. There were so many things that I liked that I knew would not be a part of where I needed to go. And I cried to him all night long. There was other things I... There was a family that lost a child I was praying for that needed a house. Southern needed so much money to build a new building. There were different other things that I laid before him that night. The next day was a Friday and the board meetings were over at Southern. My whole body tends to go down when it comes to Sabbath. Also when I'm around my daughter, my whole tension and everything comes down. She was attending Southern, so I picked her up and it got close to Sabbath. I remember hearing the phone ring in the car and I didn't understand it and I asked her, Shannon, can you pick up the phone? And I remember she said, Dad, there is no phone. It was two or three more months before I woke up from a stroke. 
I had to learn to walk again, talk again. But he took away all the emotion. He took away all the memories. I haven't gone 12 months since 1999 without being in the hospital. Right now, I'm on special medication for swelling. <laughs> I weigh the most I ever have in my life on top of three bouts with cancer and another stroke. In 2017, right after they diagnosed a cancer in the sinuses, um, a young girl got a brand new car from mom and dad and was so happy she had to text her friends while she was going 55 and a 35 and she didn't stop at the traffic light and hit me. So eight surgeries later, two for spine is what Nathan talked about. I've worked through in the last two years. And when you have the spine surgeries, you can't move. But to do the Lord's work, I'm traveling. And so how do you manage the weight? I'm less than an average of two meals a day and move as much more than they allow me, want me to move. But God is with me. He guides me. He manages the pain. He manages the stress. Your situation may not be the same. The review asked me to write an article about stuff a few weeks ago, and I explained to them, you could take a thousand pages of pure, hard miracles that I go, I've gone through in the last two or three years, any two or three years since I've been helping and working with the church. That's what each one of us is supposed to have. I'm not unique, and I know other people that go through what I go through and experience because Satan doesn't want us to be where we are. So this week, this one week, I went to the National Indian Health Boards in San Diego. And I got there Monday to meet with their executive director about the relationship with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You've heard of the Indian Health Service. You may not know that by federal law and Supreme Court rulings, Indian tribes are sovereign. That means Indian land is the same as federal land, a state unto itself. And it's classified within federal. So the Indian Health Service is there, but the tribes have the National Indian Health Board. And their function is to raise money and double check on Indian Health Service. They raise around between $750 million and $1 billion a year to operate and help in Indian country because IHS doesn't get it done. We do a magazine out of our conference, American Indian Living. It's endorsed by the 566 federally recognized tribes in North America, and it's endorsed by the National Indian Health Board. Their board called me a, uh, over a year ago, about 14 months ago, and they said, we see that the Seventh-day Adventists are different than any other organization. Will you have some people come and talk? So in 2018, in July, in Washington, D.C., Dr. DeRose and Dr. Nedley, I had go speak. They had to call in the fire marshals because so many people came to the National Indian Health Board meetings. They called me and said, we want to get closer. So last year in Oklahoma City in September, this time of year, they had meetings in Oklahoma City, which we had health screening and all different types of programs, and they got to know the conference. And they said again, we need to get to know you better. They called me a month or so ago in August and said, our offices are in DC. We have decided as Indians that Seventh-day Adventist lands our holy lands. We'd like to do our meetings for our staff as we prepare the year on holy land. Is there some place we can go? And so they went to the Chesapeake Conference camp, to their camp and had their meetings there. So when I met with their executive director on Monday, she said, I've been Lutheran my whole life. I've never been treated like that. I've never been in a situation where people talk to me and work with me like they did where I felt God. I never felt God before. On that ground and with those people, I felt God. I didn't know that all of you are vegetarian. And we took in some of our own food. We took in pork. 
And she said, they let us cook it. And they didn't say anything to us. And afterwards, somebody on our team said, aren't they vegetarian? And she said, we went and talked, and we could not believe that they allowed us to come there and eat our food and treated us the way they did. She said, I've talked to my husband and my family. Bob, I want to become a Seventh-day Adventist. I want to feel all the time like I did there. We weren't alone. We were in a meeting with the board. After the meeting was over, a millionaire, non-Indian, but he was there to see what we were doing. He works around me in different places, big in pharmacology, and he's, I, I gave him a ride to the airport, and on the ride to the airport, he said, you know, I have felt what she said for the last two, three years that I've known you. I've watched what you people do, and I've watched your life in you. I've never been baptized. He said, um, my mom and dad died when I was 18. They went to the Church of Christ, and I just didn't go anymore. My wife, Linda, she was baptized when she was a child, but she hasn't been. He said, I talked to her last night. Bob, we would like to come into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They're looking at property to buy in Oklahoma this week because they feel even more they want to be in some place where God is, so they're looking at moving to Oklahoma. These experiences are experiences each one of us are supposed to happen every day, every part of our lives. It's, it's not just pastors, it's not just people who work for the church, but if our temple is cluttered with all the noises and the bleeding of the sheep and it's all about the money of the culture, we're, we're only half full or less than half full. We sometimes act like Jesus sat during Passover at a seat and watched people giving, and the widow, he said, gave everything that she had, not suggesting you do that. But a lot of times, people will come to me and say, Bob, you believe in Adventist education? Yes. Well, you pay my child's bill. I just can't afford it. I learned way back to be careful because then I'd pay the bill and they'd go out and buy a new car. That's, that's hard to work with and deal with, but that's because of the way the temple is there. My pleading for you to, this morning is, I don't know if you realize it. You were knitted together and according to that chapter, he knew when, before you were born, you would be sitting here this morning and he would have told me to come through Nathan and give this talk to you. Is ordained. This text here, you have been called. 1 Peter 2, 21. You have been called. You can go back to John. You, you didn't, he says, you didn't come to me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. You're here because you are chosen. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. He has said you can't serve both. You're only going to serve one or the other. And the thing is, no matter what your situation, like mine, no matter how sick I might be, I still have a role to play. I have something to do. I have people to talk to. I can just go through the day living my life as I do where I get up in the morning and nothing happens until I read the scripture. If you need help with this, I'll tell you a thing that made a difference for me. It's focus on the Gospels. What did Jesus say about people saying things, Paul's writings that people don't understand? The messenger is not greater than he who sent him. Right? The student is not greater than the teacher. So I live off of the Gospels and the words of Christ. When the Catholics over a month ago, about six weeks ago, said, can we please meet with you? We're losing a lot of members in Indian country, and you guys are picking up people like crazy. What are you doing? And they were telling me what the Pope was saying, and I was giving them, it is written, the words of Christ about the Sabbath and the other issues. 
back in May, the Methodists came with the same thing. If you go to the Indian meetings, the Seventh-day Adventist denomination is the only denomination that's there anymore because the others don't know what to do. And God has done that. National Congress of American Indian, 55, 566 federally recognized tribes. On Wednesday, when it's packed this year in Albuquerque, they have put me on the agenda when it's the peakest time that everybody is there in the assembly. Their leaders did that. Because of our health program, because of what we do with them and for them, and we don't ask anything back from them, the Adventists are featured. Isn't that our role? Okay. My territory that I, I work with a lot is Indian country. Your territory is this county. Whatever touches the next church, that's your territory. You're going to be held responsible. In your area, does everybody know the real gospel? It's not your job to baptize them. The Holy Spirit convicts. You can't convict. But have you done your part to communicate to them the gospel about Christ? And in the daily workings of your life, do you start out with and pray in your head, Heavenly Father, help me today as the people that I meet that I know what to say? As you're walking down the hallways of work or if you're working in a shop or something, are you saying, guide me with this, help me to be a really good employee like Joseph was so that people see you, help me to glorify you? Do you depend upon 2 Corinthians chapter 2? Oh, I think it's the, the 12th or 13th verse. That you are Christ's love letter to everyone that's around you. Are you talking to him through the day so that he helps you with that? Because if you do, that kind of thing builds your faith. Those little prayers build your faith, build your strength, help you to remember scripture, help you to get closer to him. And then, like my brother, who was the, Bud the leader of the Budweiser band in New York for over 20 years, known as the legend in upstate New York, decided that he didn't like rock music anymore. He started going back to church, and the Lord took the taste away. He quit smoking, he quit drinking, and now he's going back to church because he let the Lord in and the Lord changed him day by day. How far, think, how far did he have to go with drinking a lot, getting drunk, smoking cigarettes, that life, that culture that we, he was in, to come to the Lord now, going to church every week. And you're, you're already here. You're already way ahead of him. But people in this area are dependent upon your church sharing Christ. Don't worry about the conference, what they're doing. Don't worry about what the division is doing. Pray for them, yes. Pray for the pastors. Pray for his work. But you get to work. You do what you were called to do because it makes a difference for you. And he takes care of you. A little over a year ago, the cle all the different hospitals had helped and looked at me and said they couldn't do much. So the Cleveland Clinic was brought in. These things are emotional for me, but the Cleveland Clinic said they couldn't help me. I'd come to a point where I was losing the use of my hands. The damage to my neck was really, really bad. The pain in my head was severe. It wasn't headaches. It was head pain all the time. It was hard to move in my lower back, and still I was trying to travel as much as I could for the Lord's work. And Cleveland Clinic came back and told my wife and I, you're going to be a quadriplegic. Nobody will do the surgery because you're going to end up a quadriplegic, and no doctor wants the blame for that. So the word went out to the government entities I consult with for free, and within two weeks, they found a surgeon designated Scottsdale, Arizona, because apparently that's the best place to be if you're quadriplegic. And they decided to do the surgery there. Uh, he was a Muslim man. And um, they briefed us on it. They spent a lot of time with my wife, Sheila, counseling what it was going to be like. And then they did the surgery. And we, Sheila and I prayed together before the surgeon took me in. After the surgery, I woke up 
And I could tell, I first right away looked at my hands and moved my hands, that I could move. And the nurses worked with me, you know, when you wake up and everything. And then the doctor came in with all the nurses that were in surgery. And he said, I've never had anything like this before. I've been doing spine surgeries for military and stuff and special people for over 20 years. He said, I cut you open an incision that he pointed was about that long. And you had the damage in these three areas and the spine was open and the leakage of the spine fluid, we could see where it was. And he said, I took my first tool to start work and the nurses started weeping profusely. And he said, all of a sudden, it was like watching a video. The spine came all back together. The spine sealed itself. I don't remember from my spoke part, but there's a name for particles on your spinal bone. He said, fell right off completely. And he said, all there was for me to do was close. The surgery took less than 45 minutes when they planned five hours. He's converted from being a Muslim to a Seventh-day Adventist, and his wife will be helping me next week in a health disparity program on the Navajo Nation in Page, Arizona. Nathan wanted you, me to tell you about others, doctors, who have become Seventh-day Adventists through my suffering. It's a good thing. The second spine surgery they did was in February. <clears throat> I re they didn't want to do it so soon. Both they and I wanted weight loss, but all of a sudden I couldn't move when I was in DC. There was a high stress event there. The government shut down and I was working with it. And when it got open and the president signed, I couldn't move. So they did about, they're not supposed to do more than three, but they did a bunch of pain shots to be able to get me stabilized, get me into a hospital. And a month later, less than a month later, on February 28th, they did the second surgery. That physician didn't use antibiotics. The incision didn't heal. Six weeks later, it was still open. I asked Sheila, I said, it hurts like a knife, isn't it? And she touched it and pus and blood came out. And so the doctors, the surgeons said, go to the emergency room. And we said, they're not going to do anything for it. It'll just cost the church money. We, we refuse to do it. We won't do it. So they made some other phone calls. And there was a special hospital that was about nine or 10 hours away. And so she had to drive me to that hospital. We got in at 4 or 5 o'clock. They took me. There was three doctors who looked over me. And um, they did imaging. And then after that, the doctors came back and said, you know, it's, it's so bad, it's going to be an extremely long surgery. You have a pouch about an inch big, inch big full of poison. Your spine is leaking. That was the head pain again because the, the, this is the lower back, not the neck, but it's leaking. And they said, this surgery is going to be so long, we need more blood. And so we're having to go get the blood. Also... This is a high emergency surgery. You weren't on the agenda tomorrow. So the plan is we're going to start surgery around near 5 o'clock. We're expecting to go most of the day. They're bringing in the blood. The doctor, the surgeon who's doing the surgery is over the whole spine program at the University, University of uh, Virginia Medical Center. He's going to be the one that's going to do the surgery. And so he wants a second look and second images. So they did more images and everything around near midnight. And the three doctors looked at me again, and they got through at 1 o'clock. And I didn't sleep. I prayed. Around near 4 o'clock, one of those doctors came back, and a nurse came in, and they said, we're going to prep you for surgery and everything. And he looked at me and looked at the incision, and he left. And Another doctor came back and said, we want to do some more imaging. And so they took me to imaging and did a whole bunch of pictures again. And then they brought me back, and another doctor came, and he looked at me and everything. They were going to do the surgery at 5, 5 o'clock or so, and by now it's about 6.15. And the top surgeon for the spine center came in, and he said, uh, let me take a look at you. So he looked at the incision and everything, and 
He said, we got a problem. And then he smiled. He said, I, I've never experienced this. He said, I've heard about it. And I, he smiled again and almost laughed and said, I've never, I've never believed it. But I see in your chart, and he said, yesterday afternoon, several doctors called me. And he said, I want you to know you made me lose 20 bucks. And I, I didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, in your chart is all these experiences with doctors where you have serious complications and those things go away. And then I wondered what, you know, what they were going to do with this long surgery. And let me tell you, eight surgeries in a, year, in a, in a few months and they put you under, it impacts your cognitive skills. You really worry about the level toward dementia that it takes you. And um, I don't know if you know Bob Holbrook. His mother passed away from having too many surgeries and the anesthesia gave her the dementia that caused it. And so while he's talking, I'm worried about that. And then he said, the fact is, when I look, your incision is closed. The imaging we did this morning, that one-inch pouch of poison is gone. Your spine has sealed. Do you still have head pain? And I said, I do. It's not as bad. He said, well, you know, I can put you on a caffeine drip, and we can wash that out. And I said, no, that's okay. And he said, well, then you just drink a lot of water for three or four days, and the pain will ease and go away. And I said, what are you saying? And he's saying... I don't want to say it, but I've lost 20 bucks. He said, it's nothing less than a miracle. We have three sets of imaging, too, that show the pouches. Near. That doesn't heal in three and a half hours, but it's not there and it's gone. He said, now I'm one of those doctors that's going to sign off with that other miracle word, and you cost me 20 bucks that I bet that, it w that what they were telling me wasn't true. And he said, now, where do I go to church this Sabbath? I've never been to church before. Where do I go this Sabbath was part of the bet with the other doctors who became Adventists. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comforts which we ourselves have received from God. That's my responsibility. That's what I'm called to do. That's my fulfillment. I go through it, I experience it, and then I go back into the hospitals and I see people that are going through what I went through. That's what I'm supposed to do. What are you supposed to do? And what are you willing to sacrifice for the gospel of Jesus Christ to go to the people of this county? Will you pray with me? How much we need you. How much we need you and we don't even realize it. So many of us come to church and, and talk of you and read our Bible sometimes, but we've never really given ourselves over to you. We've never really experienced the joy of your love in our hearts daily, moment by moment, because of the culture that we live in and how we put it first. We depend upon you. We remember this scripture this morning that it's you who comes inside of us and wills us, wills us to do your goodwill. Heavenly Father, today is a wonderful day for change because we, we come before you in these ordinances and we set our lives and our sins aside and we start afresh with you. I pray for every person that's here this morning as your servant. Go into their hearts, I pray, and into their homes this week, and may they experience you on a level they have not experienced you before. Bless this church and this school and the children. Heavenly Father, you have promised us that if we cry out to you, you will hear us. As your servant, I cry to you. You brought me here to speak. Now, O oh Lord, leave your Holy Spirit in the hearts and in the church and in the homes. I pray so earnestly in my Savior's name. Amen.